Okay? But again, you decide this in advance. And if the work is harder than what you thought it would be, you may even have to adjust it as you go. Okay? I thought I was going to get 99% complete, and guess what? I'd be happy if I make it to 90%. Okay? This is just a comment. If you remember those first panels I showed you in the license plate study, your observed numbers are obviously coming up from zero to the true number of species. If your estimator also tends to underestimate early, then you're going to have kind of artificial completeness values. But if, like I illustrated it here, where your estimator overestimates to begin with, as does Chow, then you can't get a high completeness value until the two have converged. So a very desirable quality of species richness estimators for stopping rules is that at low sample sizes, we kind of want them to overestimate. Okay? So, this is a slightly complicated figure. Um, up here are the numbers of species in four sites. Okay? 120 here, 70 here and here, and 20 here. And let's just imagine that very simply it takes us 10, it takes us one hour to detect every 10 species. This is just an illustration. So, if we were to sample every site enough to characterize the richest site well, so 12 hours per site, we sample this site well. We basically take it up to completion, whatever completion is, we take it up to completion, and we stop soon afterwards. But these three sites, we've wasted a lot of time. We spent too much time there. This site, we maybe spent 10 hours extra there. Okay? So this site ends up with everything well sampled, but it took us 48 hours, or 48 dollars, or 48 years, whatever the measure of effort is. Now, if we were to take the average number of uh, hours necessary, then these two sites are sampled right on. We get them up to completeness and we stop. This site is still oversampled. We still spent too much time there, just like we did here. But this site, guess what? We've only detected 70 of the 120 species and they're there's still 50 species left to uh, uh, encounter. The numbers don't matter. It's just we have undersampled that site. But notice that we saved 20 hours. Okay? So that is good, but we still have one sample, one site that was not finished. So now, what if we were able to be flexible? We go to this site, we spend 12 hours, we go to this site, we spend seven, here we spend seven, and here we spend two. Well then, all four sites are sampled well, and we didn't spend too much time at any one site. And we've invested only 28 hours of time. Okay? Now, are we ever going to be this precise? No. But could we use this as a way of avoiding spending six-fold too much time at something that's done? Yes. Okay? So for example, let's just, let's come back to the real world. Let's imagine, I'm probably repeating something, yeah, there we go. 
Um, let's, let's come back to the real world. The herpers are out. Sorry, guys. Yeah, not really the real world. The herpers are out, and they, let's say they have four activities. They can dig for Sicilians. They can go out and muck around in the leaf litter. They can go search streams, and they can set pitfall traps. Okay? I know there are other things you want to do, but those four things. You can take a nap. There's also that. So let's imagine they're doing all four of these things in the course of each day. And they go out, and on the first day, they are digging for Sicilians. They get two species. Second day, guess what? They get the same two species. Third day, they get the same two species. And finally, somebody says, hey guys, we're done, right? Sicilian digging is done. This inventory is complete. Can we stop? Can I go home and take a nap? And the nice thing is, is that the effort that they were using to dig for Sicilians, now, that they, now they can take that effort and put it, they can use it to augment the effort for the other activities, which are, you know, slower in getting up to an asymptote. And then maybe one of those activities, maybe they finish up the stream, it plateaus, the inventory statistics get up to 1.0, there were four frogs along that stream, and that's it, no more. So now they have all that time also to use for scraping around in the leaf litter and pitfall trapping. Yeah, hold on. Whatever you're going to say, joke or not, I want it on tape. So I just wanted to make the point that, um, that the, the exercise we're going through here optimizes a particular thing, and that thing is diversity, detection of species diversity. Mm -hmm. That's the quantity that we're, we're getting closer and closer and optimizing our time towards that, that, that one quantity, that one part of our, our job here is doing biodiversity inventories. But um, we all know the situation in which we found that one Sicilian, and it's a really important specimen that hasn't been collected in 100 years, and so um, uh, we would like to have some extra time towards the end of the survey to go look for a couple more specimens. Or we find a new species and we only have a couple of specimens, and it'd be great if we could find some females of the new species. So anyways, I'm just trying to make the point that this seems like a great way to buy ourselves some extra time to augment the collections towards the other goals that we all have as part of these inventories, which is getting good series of specimens so we can do taxonomic works or discover new species or rediscover new species, or spend a lot of time on natural history data or associations of amphibians and their habitats or all the other kinds of things we like to do. Yeah, so it either frees up your time to do those activities at the end, or you build into your stopping rules that I also want to have, you know, five specimens of 90% of the species. You know, whatever. You know, but yeah, very good point. So basically that's the message with results-based sampling. What I'm trying to do is, I mean, if you think about all the talks this week, they've been orienting us, when possible, away from sampling an impossibly large universe and towards inventory, which is a, a capturable universe, right? A measurable universe. Um, and I'm trying to get you thinking about collecting the right data along the way, analyzing the data to whatever degree possible along the way, and using those analyses to optimize your time. You know, sometimes, very simply, we get into situations where we are wasting time. I'll give you an example that speaks positively of herpetologists, which is to say, 
an example where herpetologists collect birds, right? Um, Rafe and I were on an island in the northern Philippines, and it has a very small avifauna. And for whatever reason in the Philippines, you just don't do very well with mist nets. And this island was very disturbance driven. And so really there weren't any birds in the understory. What birds there were were kind of up in the canopy. And so the bird team put out a bunch of mist nets. And there were days when we were getting like four birds. And our time was just not well spent putting up more nest, mist nets, putting up more mist nets. And so, you know, in that case, it wasn't so much of completeness, it was just that it was, it was a waste of time. And so we really cannibalized the mist netting effort. And one of the ways that we managed to get something out of that island was we would buy Rafe beers and he would bring us birds that he found at night. Okay? So the point is that you can use your time flexibly, you can use your resources flexibly, but you want that flexibility to be measured and to be planned based on the quality of your results. If you do this, there are some big benefits. Just as we've been talking about inventories all along, if you have equally complete inventories for a set of sites, comparing those sites is much more fruitful. If I compare two sites and I found 100 species at one and 20 species at the other, my initial thought is, wow, this place has five times as many species. But if I spent 50 days at the first and two days at the second, maybe it's not that one site is richer than the other, but rather that my inventory is very incomplete at the second site. So if I were to have inventory statistics that can attest to the fact that both inventories were equally complete, then I have some reason to believe that indeed the first site is richer. Okay? Um, if I'm interested in whether a species is absent from a site or from a set of sites, if I have these statistics, not finding a species at a site where my inventory is 60% complete is probably just because I didn't detect it yet. But if my inventory is you know, solidly 95, 99% complete and I don't find that species, then I have higher confidence that I didn't find that species because that species is not there. So there are all sorts of benefits to achieving some consistent level of quality of results in your inventory work. Yes. My question is that, have you published anything on results-based sampling that uh, I can that you can use? Cite? You support site support. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. I see the benefits to it. I've been used to the thinking that to be able to compare sites when you're using inventory data that you must put the same efforts uh -huh. in the same yeah. place for yeah, them yeah. to be compared. It's what all of us are taught, you know, that's how you sample. Um, have I, so the, the uh, Peterson and Slade paper lays out the whole argument, okay. but it's not a full implementation. Because okay. it, it, I think the subtitle of it is the importance of stopping rules, okay? okay? Um, so I think that's the thing to cite. I haven't, I haven't done this in a formal sense and you know, written it up as you know, using results-based sampling. I probably should, but it's one of those things I never get around to. <laughs>